The Isle of Man is a bit of an oddity. It's set squarely in the middle of the British Isles and yet forms no part of Great Britain. It isn't even part of the United Kingdom and yet our monarch is also the Lord of Man. You can trundle along the Douglas Promenade in a horse-drawn tram and you can arrive on the Isle of Man on board one of the most modern of jets. You can come there because you like its taxation system and lack of death duties, or you can come as a tourist to get rid of a little of your money. As one more oddity, it has still got steam. Whether you're there for the offshore finance or the blend of old and new, or because it's a change from Blackpool and Morecambe and has the romance of being an island with everybody in the old days, such as the Vikings having to come by boat, it's now famous for some because of its railways. It isn't a very big island, being only some 30 miles long, but the railways have played an important part in its history and commerce, and now nostalgia and tourism. You might have thought that such an island with its independence and unique government and craggy scenery would have wanted nothing to do with such things as trains, but not a bit of it. The steam railways crossed the island, high ground permitting, but then vanished, first from Ramsey and then from Peel. However, there is still Douglas to Port Erin. As with almost everywhere, the roads have taken the load the railways used to bear. And the railway buildings might seem no more than a front, like ancient castles telling of former times, of the days of steam. But behind them, there is still steam blowing its trumpet in a manner it alone can do. the most unique transport systems in the British Isles, if not the whole of Europe. Uh, not only have you got uh, a modern bus service, which you've got everywhere, of course, but you've got this unique vintage railway system, which dates back until 1870s in, some, in certain cases. Uh, the electric railway, the steam railway, the Snaefell Mountain Railway, marvellous systems all completely different, all with their own type of image, their own atmosphere. And it's that type of thing which really is a boyhood dream, I suppose, uh, to be in charge of running such an enterprise. Well, firstly, is it a tramway? Is it a railway? But it's certainly the Isle of Man. And the Isle of Man was very much ahead of the times for the Douglas and Laxey Coast Electric Tramway started in 1893. London didn't get its first electric trams until this century, 1901, and Birmingham, 1903, or 10 years after the Manx Company had shown the way, and so excitingly. The island is not short of contours, and the construction of its tramway was a sort of challenge that appealed to the supremely confident Victorians who seemed to prefer the problems caused by all that mountain scenery. But they didn't only push their trams into the glens, they did the same with steam. And this steam, having fallen into disrepair, was then lovingly restored by, among others, Tony Beard. Well, years ago, we were volunteers working on the steam railway, and when it was nationalised, we found that we were no longer required. So we still wanted to do something in railway preservation, and so we decided to restore this St Manx Glen Railway. I suppose one disadvantage of train sets is that they aren't big enough. They're not quite the real thing. But this certainly is, and has been, off and on, since 1893.
Built originally in Stafford and then restored by apprentices at Sellafield, Sea Lion is now 95 years old and will plainly hit a century or maybe two. They don't work her too hard, but it's usual to get her in steam on summer Sunday mornings to pull another load of tourists. And that, strangely, is what this particular railway was always designed to do. There was never any more serious business than taking a bunch of tourists along a length of line and then bringing them back again. So it's now business as usual along Graudel Glen, thanks to the Isle of Man Steam Railway Supporters Association. The railway was closed for World War II, closed again in 1960, and then reopened for passengers in 1985. Everyone who works here is a volunteer. Ron Cooper, ticket seller, usually works in an office. Colin Kelly, guard, works in a brewery. And the driver of the train, Kevin Lewin, is a storeman. Well, this is a marvellous example of some Victorian engineer who decided to develop a glen and build a two-foot gauge narrow gauge railway, three quarters of a mile long, to serve a zoo where there were sea lions and polar bears, hence the name of the two locomotives that served the line for many years. It's supposed to be a hobby, but it's nearly turning out to be a full-time job. But it's very, very enjoyable. Every minute I spend down here is totally enjoyable. I know for, I speak that for everybody who comes down. A total commitment, and it's good fun. And to see people's faces travelling on the trains, and you see them enjoying themselves as a result of your efforts, makes it all worthwhile. That's what I like about it. Journeys end with lots of bracing sea air, and you can tell it's an English summer because so many are wearing anoraks. In the old days, there was more to this headland station than just a headland. The engine had been called Sea Lion because it used to call at the sea lions, and down there at the end of the last century, someone had built a zoo with sea lions and polar bears, and bits of the old cages still remain. Today, you just have to look, take deep breaths of air, and imagine what it must have been like when you could stroll across the bridge and look down and across at the animals. It isn't typical polar bear country, but perhaps a touch nearer than Regent's Park. Anyway, the place attracted 100,000 visitors in its first three months, and they had to run 40 trains a day. It was one of the sights to be seen before it was time for everyone to be back on the coaches and then back down the glen. But there's still, as it were, a proper railway that's a touch more intercity than just going to a zoo. The Isle of Man railways still exist, with Douglas being the major station, and they are still in steam. We are a full-time employer. The, the railway doesn't run with uh, volunteer labour. So all our staff are very flexible. The majority of them can do at least two jobs and a lot of them three or four jobs. So the trains that are running now with the drivers and firemen and guards, in the winter, they are switched on to the maintenance of track and vehicles. And the 
full-time engineering staff also turn out in the summer to work extra duties on the traffic and between the lot of them we keep the whole job going. The staff are excellent on the Isle of Man Railways. We have a very flexible staff. They go from making springs from the locomotives, painting, doing traffic work, being a guard, a station master, a ticket collector, all sorts of things uh, each person is expected to do. And they do it well. You see, they've got a vocation. That's important. They care about the railway. And without them, we wouldn't have an Isle of Man steam railway. The Isle of Man Railway, built on a three-foot gauge, started work in 1873, and the first steam engine was number one. But number 13 is no chicken, having entered service in 1910. Not only still going strong, but or so it would appear, shining no less brightly after the passage of almost eight decades. Of course, the line was busier in the old days, but with some of those engines still working, there's a great feeling of continuity between then and now. But with one difference, that the platforms still had their canopies in the old days. The surviving length of track runs from Douglas to Port Erin, about a dozen miles as a crow might make the journey, but nearer 20 by steam. So steam lives, but only goes to Port Erin in the summertime, when there are more visitors to use and see this whiff of the past. Steam trains have now been running on this line for 114 years. First to Port Soderick, then Santon and Ballasalla and Castletown and Ballabeg and Colby and Port St Mary. And finally to Port Erin, which under a clear blue sky can look most magical. The connection between Port Erin and Douglas has had its hiccups, notably in the 1960s when lines were being closed with such enthusiasm. But the old signs were not taken down and are now useful all over again. The first memory must have been looking out of the window of the uh, Martins Bank House where we used to live, uh, eagerly awaiting the arrival of whatever train was on its way in and uh, wondering whether it was my father or grandfather who'd be driving. Mike Buttle's father on the left and grandfather Buttle on the right. In fact, the grandfather retired three times and was called back twice because they couldn't replace him. But it was Mike's father mainly who gave him a love of steam and who helped to make this a fourth generation railway family, one just as long lasting as the trains they served. The smell of the railway was, was with us over in Bank House all of the time. Um, with living more or less on top of the railway, you used to get the smell of, of the steam drifting into the house. And uh, there was always the smell of my father's overalls lying around the place. 
The station building itself is undoubtedly the most beautiful building in Port Erin. It's a red brick construction. It was built by a, a local firm of builders in the early years of the century. It's all done on a theme. The uh, decoration over the station windows and doors is also in the uh, barge boards on the top of the roof. There's this carved arch that's reflected throughout the whole building. I think only a true fanatic would say that Port Erin's railway station is the most beautiful building in town. But you need that kind of enthusiasm if the virtues of the past are not to be swept aside in pursuit of modernity. Inside in the booking office what we're trying to do is recreate the sort of feel of the place as it must have looked between 1910 and say 1920. Uh, you see we've got a lot of the original posters we've rescued from various stations along the line. And that means everything is a touch old-fashioned, like the tickets and politeness. No, no, these are return tickets. Oh, thank you. To Douglas. Right. Could you have your tickets ready, please? Thank you. Thank you. The satisfaction really comes from, from the whole job, from seeing the loco coming out in the morning, nice and clean, and the passengers oh, rolling up for their tickets and the smiles on their faces as they go off for their, for their day out. Then seeing another train full of people coming back in. It's having to deal with the people, uh, having to deal with the, with the crews, and uh, any problems that may come up during the day. Um, it is a very satisfying experience, and it's one that I take a, a great amount of pride in. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All the little engines have their own little personalities, um, and I, I look forward to, to seeing them coming in, and the, the different makeups of the trains, the rolling stock, uh, whatever order it's in in that particular day. There's always something interesting to find going on. A commuter in, for example, southern England might wonder if this is modern times at all and when he last had a door open for him. <laughs> well, occasionally during the summer, I suppose my, my mother wanted to get rid of me for the day. I'd be uh, bundled off with my father and taken off to Douglas uh, on the engine. Of course, we'd never start off on the engine at Port Erin. Um, Mr Nelson wouldn't have approved of that sort of thing. But as soon as we got into Port St Mary, you get out of the guard's van on the blind side of Mr Corkish, who was the station master there, and climb into the loco cab and set off towards Douglas. And uh, it was always a marvellous feeling to be in the footplate with them. One of the things I can remember is that they used to keep their tea in these enamel pots with wire handles hanging from the lamp brackets on the back plate of the boiler and uh, keep the tea hot for the journey into Douglas. And uh, we run in through Colby and Castletown and then crossed the other train at Balasala and tucked into the corner of the cab there. You'd be out of the sight of the station masters and so you'd be all right. It would be easy to think that the young Mike Buttle didn't have to bother with a train set at home when there were real trains to play with, dad and granddad permitting. And at Port Sodrick station, it was a case of having to get off the loco and back into the guards van. It wouldn't have done to be seen by uh, Mr Kelly and Douglas or where still the general manager Mr Sheard whose office was on the corner of the administrative buildings. Uh, he had a, a like a protruding bay window and he could look out onto the platforms and over the goods yard and see all that was going on and of course uh, if I'd been seen getting off the footplate in Douglas then uh, my father would have been in serious trouble and probably up to Mr Sheard's office in double quick time. But apart from the task of keeping the young bottle out of sight, there was coaling to be done, and also maintenance of the engines, which were getting on in age even then. On the approach to Douglas Station, there used to be a big double gantry signal on the side of the workshops. That's no longer there. I was always bundled off to the signal box to sit with Bobby Tate, who was a great old boy, he's the signalman at Douglas, and he'd always have a, a brew of hot tea on, and uh, I can remember sitting there talking to, to Bobby, you'd always get a cup of tea in one of these old enamel mugs. It was steaming hot, so hot you could hardly hold it. 
and uh, he'd sit and talk about the, the other two great loves of his life. He used to breed budgies and make model boats and uh, spent quite a few happy occasions up with uh, good old Bobby. But budgies and model boats permitting, there was always lots to do at Douglas, as it was a busy railhead before the closures came. Both Peel and Ramsey were then connected. Trains heading out from Douglas towards Peel and Ramsey would always be double-headed. The Peel and the Ramsey section would make up the train. When the train would arrive at St John's, it would be split into two sections. And the loco that would brought the train up from Peel to St John's would take the uh, train back down into Peel. The Ramsey loco would continue on the run up to uh, Ramsey. St John's station was really the hub of the island railway system. At one time, you could get trains out to uh, Ramsey, to Peel, back into Douglas, and down to the little mining village of Foxdale. It was always great fun when uh, two trains used to leave St John's at the same time, one bound for Peel and one for Ramsey. Officially, they were supposed to leave within two minutes of each other, but uh, quite often the crews would hang about and they would race each other out of the station. As I remember, the Peel train always used to win the race because it was going downhill. But it's always great fun to be sitting in one of the carriages of one train and watching the other train go away into the distance. You could always tell the approach to the Peel station because the smell of the, the fish factories and the kipper works would come up uh, from Peel to greet you before you were actually in the village itself. Peel station was situated right on the harbour. A really picturesque setting on a, a sunny day. If we went down to Peel, we used to take a picnic with us and go and sit on the grass uh, over by Peel Castle and watch the trains come in and out. It was a sad day when the Peel service finished in 1968. The trains may vanish, but not all the names or even all the buildings, such as the stations themselves, and this one is now a fisherman's cooperative. This is Glenwell and Viaduct. There used to be a pleasure ground underneath, which was owned and operated by the railway company. Uh, there was a little cafe and amusement arcade and boating pool. All the crockery was printed with the railway company crest. It was a nice little place, Glenwell. It's nice to remember the old days and what a viaduct used to look like, but keeping an aged railway going with aging locomotives and aging rolling stock is a major problem for, among others, traffic superintendent Graham Warhurst. With the vehicles, it's really the age of them, particularly the wooden-bodied coaches, and we're now finding, as well as needing constant attention, the older ones, and I'm talking of coaches that have been in service for 100, 105 years, and now requiring major bodywork attention. Yes, major bodywork attention, and a considerable task for craftsman David Maddox. Well, you get a wreck like this comes in, when it goes out, it's as good as new. That's, that's the satisfaction. Well, this coach here was uh, being used the past about 10 years, anyway, down Sea Terminal. It's a tourist information centre and leaflets selling tickets for the railways. It's in a bad state, but about six months' time, it would be running again, and it's going to be around for probably longer than I will. There was nothing plastic about the old coaches, and so nothing plastic about the renovation, just good mahogany. And there's also nothing about the workshop that smacks of very modern times. It's more like industrial archaeology, with the old machines still doing the same old job. What was good enough for the Industrial Revolution still keeps the wheels turning for the Isle of Man railways and provides the power for Colin Goldsmith to do his new job. He used to be an electrician. I've had to learn a completely new trade, really, and I've, I've enjoyed a great deal of satisfaction from that, and knowing that I've been able to do that, having, should we say, learned to do a reasonable amount of boiler making, should we say, in respect of fitting in tubes, things like that.
we're carrying out this work now. We've just done a reasonable amount of restaying. It's just been retubed, given that we'll probably have to retube every eight or nine years. And apart from that, we would like to be thinking of reading 25 years, perhaps, service out of this boiler, and likewise out of the other three boilers. Well, you might expect boilers to need retubing, but what about springs breaking? They've still got to be put right, and you can't buy them off the shelf any more than you can buy the engines. So, self-sufficiency is the keynote. And remember what they used to do, and what they did it with, and how they used the tools in those good old engineering days when, if you wanted something, it was up to you to make it. Mainly, it's a job where uh, there aren't any hard and fast rules. You, you've got to make a lot of your rules up as you go along. If you work in a factory, uh, everything is laid down for you and you work exactly as you're told to work. Here, as I say, you've got to make a lot of your own equipment and uh, a lot of fabrication and a bit of ingenuity uh, as well. I'm not really a steam fanatic, but it does give me a kick, uh, you know, to see uh, a bit of my own work. It doesn't really matter that it is a steam engine. It could be, could be any other uh, old piece of machinery. These things have to be uh, preserved. And, uh, well, I'm lucky I'm in a job where uh, I'm doing that sort of thing. The satisfaction that I get is in, uh, well, innovation, call it, uh, using modern materials to make replacement items for the old engines, but using the techniques and equipment that the old timers used. Brown Crossfield Blacksmith. New springs for old, and the satisfaction of a good job well done. But so too with the railway system as a whole and keeping this piece of the old days alive in modern times. It's that which is the task of the chief executive, Robert Smith. We have people coming long distances to see the railway, and although we seek cost efficiencies and we can give value for money, the railway must still survive in its present form if we're to attract the people as a tourist island. My job is to see that the railway steadily improves so that it's here for my son's generation, my grandson's generation. So into the next century, the Isle of Man Steam Railway will still be here. <laughs>